Good evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to our program tonight. We're delighted to present a, a conversation with Director Ken Quapis, who's joining us from his home in, in Los Angeles. He'll be telling us about his book, which is titled, But What I Really Want to Do is Direct, Lessons from, behind, from a Life Behind the Camera. It was published on October 6th by St. Martin's Griffin Press. You can check it out from the library, according to, uh, along with DVDs of many of Mr. Quapis's films and TV series. I'd like to give a special shout out tonight to Mr. Quapis's sister, Cynthia Tobush, who is here tonight and who suggested this event to the library and to her brother. So thank you, Cynthia. Uh, as we go through the program, you're, you are uh, invited to put your questions into the chat and I'll ask them on your behalf toward the end. Mr. Quapis will be joined tonight by Donald Liebenson. Donald writes about film for the Washington Post, Vanity Fair, New York Magazine, the LA Times, and Turner Classic Movies. He's seen a few. Before we get started, I'm going to put a very short one, one question poll up on your screen. Let's see, like so. Hmm. And um, we're just trying to get an idea of how many viewers we have here tonight. So if you could just Click the relevant button. The numbers are going up. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. I demand a recount. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just me, 63%. Two people, 31%. And three people, 6%. I don't know if anyone counted their dogs or not. Great, thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you for being here tonight. Um, Donald, I'm going to hand it over to you now, so go ahead. Thank you, Grace. Malcolm in the Middle, The Bernie Mac Show, The Larry Sanders Show, The Office. Besides being among TV's very best comedies, they all have one thing in common. Some of their very best episodes were directed by our guest tonight. And not content with creating appointment television, he has also directed uh, 11 feature films, including He's Just Not That Into You, the YA classic Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, Sesame Street Follow That Bird, and Dunstan Checks In, a boy and his orangutan movie that elicited what he calls the most mind-blowing compliment he ever received. And that's what we in the interview business called a tease. We'll get to that later. But it turns out what he really wanted to do was write a book. And that book, what I really want to do is direct Lessons Learned from a Life Behind the Camera. It's part memoir, part film appreciation, but also an invaluable primer for budding filmmakers with practical advice that you won't find in a textbook or in a film school curriculum. These. Um, so Ken has um, given me some of my favorite half hours of television. Uh, just off the top of my head, the episode Water Park from Malcolm in the Middle. That's the one where B. Arthur dances with Dewey to Abbas Fernando. And now he's written one of my favorite film books, and I'm thrilled that he's with us tonight. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Happy to be at the library. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to get started, if, if you're at home watching TV and, you, you know, the office is on a loop on TBS, and if, if you come across one of your episodes, if you come across one of your films, do you watch it? Oh, <laughs> well, um, I will say not too long ago, I stumbled upon, not stumbled upon, I shouldn't say that, I, I re-watched the episode Casino Night because I was asked to be uh, interviewed about that episode and I hadn't seen it since it came out. And it's uh, a significant office episode, partly because uh, it is the episode in which the characters Pam and Jim kiss for the first time. And I thought, if I may, I thought, yeah, it's pretty darn good. Uh, by the way, that <laughs> episode was written by Steve Carell. That was his first contribution as a screenwriter to the show. Wow, I yeah. didn't know that. Um, so the book first, what, uh, it's not like you're not too busy directing. What was the inspiration for you to write the book? Well, I, I mean, I've been directing for several decades, but over the past 10 years, I've been mentoring a lot of up and coming filmmakers. 
and younger filmmakers. And there's a lot of discussion about craft, uh, you know, how to talk to actors, where to put the camera, things like that. But I found that a lot of the young directors started, were asking questions that were great questions and topics that were not covered in my film school experience. For instance, how to assert authority on a set without becoming authoritarian. I'm just, that's just one of many examples. And I thought, you know, this is actually, a, these are things that somebody should write a book about. So I just decided to start doing it. And, it, and I didn't plan on it going in any given direction. I just started jotting things down. I didn't even want, I didn't even admit I was writing a book for a long time. Um, but it just started to sprout in different directions, including, as you said, you know, a lot of reminiscences about things I've worked on, a lot of reminiscences about films that had a huge impact on me. And then again, a lot of um, a, a lot of answers to a lot of questions that don't get raised in film school. Mm. So you grew up here, Belleville, uh, Illinois. And the first question I want to ask, I grew up here in Highland Park. My theater was the Alcyon. What was your movie theater? Well, I would say that, you know, there, there are so many important theaters uh, in, in my childhood, but I, I just, I have to single out the Skyview Drive-In, hmm. uh, which is still going, which is still, which is actually having a, you know, a, a really robust, you know, business during the pandemic. Um, but the Skyview Drive-In was built in, I think the late forties, maybe 49. It was almost destroyed by a tornado. Hmm. Uh, rebuilt. And then in the early 60s, when I be, uh, you know, became a young, you know, very young film goer, I saw some of my very first films there, in including the first one, uh, the first film, it may be the, probably the first film I ever saw, King Kong versus Godzilla, Excellent. which my father took me to. And, and uh, I have I have not seen it to this day when I, I think I was probably five years old when I saw it, but I was so petrified by the film. I like I didn't see it. I hid under the dashboard of the car. <laughs> so, but the sky view is very important in my in my upcoming um, up my growing up. And uh, we were fortunate to grow up at a time. This is BC before cable, but um, uh, audience members or um, who are of a certain age will remember family classics with Fraser Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, when movies were movies on Sunday night on WGN and NBC Saturday night movies. Were you fans of those? Is that where you got a lot oh, of your yeah. film education? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was for me appointment television. If there was a Marx Brothers film playing, you know, on, on one of our local stations, that's, I was going to clear out clear the decks and watch it so i feel like that was my first revival house was uh tele, a television set in, in the late 60s and uh yeah I'm, but i feel very i'm kind of jealous of young people these days because you can get any anything at your fingertips these days and, and i hope that young film buffs are taking advantage of the access and, and getting to see things that in our day when we were younger you had to like get in the car and drive, you know, 60 miles to some small school where they were playing an obscure, you know, film. So now you can do it right here on the laptop. Do you remember the movie where you first became aware somebody made this movie? You know, there is somebody, well, I don't know if you, you would use the word director, but somebody made this movie and yeah. who became your favorites? You know, it's funny, I, I um, I think that I can't really point to one particular film, but I but I will. I'll say that in in the late 1960s, I guess it was 68, I was really uh, taken with the film Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, George Roy Hill's film, and um, which is I, I haven't seen it for a long time, but at the time I could tell that there was somebody making choices, somebody behind the scenes, somebody pulling the strings, someone behind the curtain making choices that were making this film more interesting than other films. And what were those choices and who was that person? So, I mean, I, I do remember uh, that that film was kind of a turning point for me. Uh, the, needless to say, 1968, there were a lot of amazing films that I saw that year as well. Films like 2001 A Space Odyssey, but Butch Cassidy really, really had an impact on me. And then I, I feel like one, you know, 
a wonderful you know, turn of events several decades later. I you know, had the pleasure of directing the Sundance Kid himself in a movie. So, so uh, there's a great story near the beginning of the book about uh, your first camera and breaking your first camera. Um, at what point did did you go from you know making your own films at home to this is what I want to do? Uh, I want to pursue being a director. You know, I uh, growing up in Belleville, Illinois, I certainly had access to interesting films, especially when I got a driver's license and I could drive across the river into St. Louis and, and go to some bona fide revival houses or go to certain universities where they were running films. But it never occurred to me that you could actually make a living doing this. <laughs> it never, I, I knew no one in the entertainment business. Uh, and I would say that, you know, my, my parent, my father was, a, was an oral surgeon and didn't know anyone in the entertainment business either, but he, you know, I'm very blessed and, and happy to say that he, uh, he didn't get in the way. He didn't, I mean, it's a completely impractical career route and he never once said, don't do it. So <laughs> I, I, I'm eternally grateful for his uh, support along the way. Well, you went to, I believe, Northwestern, mm -hmm. and then you uh, you uh, got your master's at uh, USC, mm -hmm. and so we skipped that, and we're we're out of college now. Um, and again, readers of a certain age will get a kick out of who hired you for your first professional job. What was that job, and what was it like to meet Captain Kangaroo? <laughs> yes, I. I uh... I will say that the Captain Kangaroo gave me my first job out of film school. I had a chance to interview for what was uh, called the CBS Afternoon Playhouse. There was a, a short-lived series that was CBS's attempt to compete with ABC's very popular after-school special. And uh, the CBS Afternoon Playhouse that I interviewed for, uh, I had to go to New York and I had to meet the executive producer of the show the executive producer was Bob Keeshan, known to millions of baby boomers as Captain Kangaroo. And I was uh, incredibly nervous to meet Captain Kangaroo. I, I feel like, okay, here is somebody who I spent countless hours watching while you know, probably sucking my thumb. And here I am now trying to get a job from him. And um, I would say the interview was very memorable for one reason and one reason only, and that is soon into the interview, cap the captain, I'll call him the captain, the captain mm -hmm. ran out of things to ask. He, did, he I don't, I got the sense that he <laughs> hadn't really interviewed a lot of directors in his uh, time. He ran out of things to ask and sort of stumped for what to say. He finally said, well, Ken, tell me how your grades were in school. Mm -hmm. And I like, I was, I froze because in fact, um, I left school without finishing my degree and several classes were left incomplete. And at a certain point they would convert to Fs if I didn't complete them. And I suddenly thought, well, what the captain must know something about my academic career. And I thought, I, I, I can't let him know that I, I left all these classes unfinished. So I lied and I said, I, well, my grades were great. And then I worried that the captain was gonna call my school and get the transcript sent over, but instead he gave me the job, so. <laughs> Another one of your first assignments was an episode of Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. And I was wondering if you had a chance, a young director like he was when he started, did you have a chance to sit down and talk to him about directing and making a career out of this? I, I, I certainly had meetings with him. They were focused on the individual episode that I directed. And I'll just, for those of you who know Amazing Stories, I, I find this really interesting. The show, I think the show lasted two seasons mm -hmm. and it was noteworthy because each episode had an immense amount of production value. There was, you know, was huge visual effects and big sets and all this. And at first when I was hired, I was also assigned a story that had a, a lot of logistical challenges. But what happened is like midway through prepping that story, Spielberg just without any reason just pulled the plug on it and instead gave me a different episode to direct, one that was so simple, that was so minimal and, and so harkened back to like the Twilight Zone. It, it felt like a, 
it didn't belong in amazing stories. And I'll just describe the plot of it very simply. It takes place in a car at night. Mm -hmm. Kathy Baker is driving the car. She picks up somebody on the side of the road who's having car trouble, an older woman named Priscilla Pointer. They get in the car and drive down the road. And over the course of the half hour, Kathy discovers that Priscilla is actually her older self. Mm. That's the whole story. Oh, okay. No visual effects. <laughs> I mean, it, again, the most minimal. And I thought, wow, what a fantastic guy. What a fantastic thing to do. What a great challenge to make something really dynamic and com visually compelling with just mm -hmm. two people in a car for a half hour. So I'm thrilled that, um, that Spielberg gave me that assignment. Mm -hmm. Uh, another wonderful story from the book, uh, from another memorable meeting, is meeting Jim Henson. And can you talk about the green piece of felt that was just lying on a table while you were talking to him? I, I met Jim Henson on, uh, to direct the film Sesame Street Presents Follow That Bird. It was the first feature film to star the Sesame Street characters. There'd been the Muppet movie and and I guess there may be a, a couple of Muppet movies, but no films featuring Big Bird, Oscar the Grouch, et cetera. So I had to interview with a number of people, but chiefly Jim Henson. And when I sat down with him in his office, um, we sat on a couple of chairs and between us was a coffee table and there was nothing on the coffee table, no magazines or anything, but there was a clump of green felt, which looked like somebody had left it there because they were, you know, cleaning and I didn't give it any thought. But when the, as the interview progressed, I said to Jim, um, that I, I, I said, Jim, I've never directed a puppet before. I don't know how to talk to a puppeteer. And, and, and I do remember at the time thinking either this was a, very savvy move on my part or that the meeting was about to go off the rails. And, and in fact, it was the former. And Jim said very graciously, he goes, all you need to do is talk to the puppeteers like they're actors. And at that moment, he reached over and got out the piece of green felt and put his hand in it. And the green felt was Kermit. <laughs> and so I sat there and Jim started talking to me as Kermit. And by the way, I'm giving you a little knuckle demonstration here. For those of you who know the Muppets, I would say m the vast majority of the characters have these foam core heads, like Bert and Ernie, they're like this. But Kermit the Frog was all about Jim's knuckles. And it's amazing how much uh, visual, you know, facial expression he got out of those knuckles. And, and Jim was incredibly, uh, I mean, right away, I got the sense that he wanted me to do the film. He, he only made one demand of me uh, during this meeting. He said, and, I, and demand was the right word. He really insisted on one thing. He insisted that on the first day of shooting the film that I gather the entire crew, how, you know, 30, 40 people, bring everyone together. And, and he said, Ken, I want you to ask every crew member to raise one hand up in the air for a solid minute. And the reason he wanted me to do that is he wanted the crew, he wanted every crew member to appreciate actually how hard it is for puppeteers to keep their hands in the air while you're making umpteen lighting and camera adjustments with their puppets. And he wanted everyone to be super sensitive to that. And in fact, holding your hand in the air for a solid minute is actually not easy. So. <laughs> But he was, I would say, considering uh, that I was the newbie, that I was the young, possibly the youngest member of the crew, and certainly the least experienced on a feature film, he was incredibly gracious towards me. And, so. Well, you've mentioned Kermit, and I don't know if you're the type to be starstruck. I don't know if a director has that luxury, but what has it been like to be directing legends such as let's say Carol Burnett from the Larry Sanders show or Robert Redford in A Walk in the Woods, Faye Dunaway and Dunstan Checks In. What is that experience like? I mean, I, I think that, I mean, the challenge is on one hand, you want to respect people's, um, you want to, you know, you want to acknowledge, you know, the, the, the great work that some of these people have done, but that at the same time that can get in your way too as a director, because what you really want to do is get them in a mood to play. You just want, you know, whether it's Faye Dunaway or Robert Redford, or Carol Burnett's very playful. But I mean, what you really want to do is just get people in, in a mood to play, to be playful, to not feel like, you know. So I try my best 
and and believe me, you know, Robert Redford is not simply a, a movie star of the highest order, but he's also this kind of in, very important figure in American filmmaking. And and but the good news about I'll just I'll talk about Redford for a second. When we started working together, he said, "Ken, I'm going to take off my director's hat. I'm going to take off my producer's hat. I'm just going to be the actor. I just want to be directed. That's all. I'm. That's my job in this picture." So he was actually very upfront and clear, and actually he really appreciated the direction. So um, I'll tell you a great Carol Burnett story, though. Yes. Uh, at least it's great for me. <laughs> is that we were rehearsing a scene in the Larry Sanders show that takes place during a taping of the show within the show. And what happens during the taping is there is a spider expert who is one of the guests on the show within the show. And at one point the spiders get loose and everyone screams and, and Larry jumps up and Carol Burnett is so freaked out. She steps onto the Larry's desk and then leaps onto his back. Okay. So uh, that was the action that was scripted and we were, getting ready to shoot and Gary was not available to rehearse. So Carol just said, Ken, come on over here. I'm going to jump on your back. So we ran the scene and she jumped up on the desk and I stood where Gary would stand. Wow. And she literally leaped on my back. <laughs> I thought, Oh my God, don't fall over and hurt Carol Burnett. But, uh, but she was, she was, uh, I'm sure she still is. She was just simply so game and so playful. So. That's great. Now you now you can tell people I carried Carrie Burnett. I carried <laughs> Burnett. Um, it's the same question, but I have to give him his own. Uh, you worked with Robin Williams and on License to Wed. What was that experience like? The um, you know I will say that Robin is known for many things, but primarily known for these kind of off the charts improvisational abilities, his ability to pick up an object and just go to town with it for 20 minutes and just riff on it. And um, I had the pleasure of working with him on a, where he played a, a, a reverend, a, a minister, I guess. And he was being very focused on the role. Of course, he can't not improvise, but he, I found him to be a really fine actor and a very disciplined actor. Um, again, I'll share one funny thing that happened with him. <clears throat> I did not write about this in the book, but this is uh, when we were working together on the film License to Wed, a lot of the younger actors, really uh, all the younger actors, especially the guys, wanted to do Christopher Walken impersonations. I don't know why, this was like the rage. Everybody wanted to do a Chris Walken impersonation. So John Krasinski did one, some of the other actors did one. Well, Robin Williams, of course, was not to be outdone, started doing impersonations of other people doing Chris Walken impersonations. So he was like, he was adding a, a, a comp, an impossible degree of difficulty to the impersonation. So he did Marlon Brando doing Chris Walken. So, and it was that, it's that classic, you know, we're all playing checkers and he's playing 3D chess kind of thing. So, but he, um, I, you know, again, he was, he was definitely someone where occasionally I would s step back and say, wow, that is, that is like a natural wonder, <laughs> like his abilities. And, and also working with him taught me that occasionally the best thing that a director can do, especially with certain kinds of talent, is just shut up and get out of the way. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw Judd Apatow's something like four eight hour documentary on Gary Chandler. Yeah. Yeah. And by That's all great. accounts, he was a very profound presence. And you have a chapter about the Larry Sanders show in the book. But do you have a favorite Gary Shandling story that stands out that kind of gets to his essence? Well, I, uh, this is what I lead, lead off with, with the chapter. And this was um, when I met Gary for the first time uh, to work on the show, I directed the pilot of the show, the pilot episode. And I remember asking Gary if he could kind of sum up the show in a sentence or two and just give me some kind of what, what's the mission statement of this show? What's, you know, if you had to boil it down to one statement, what is it? And Gary thought about that for quite a bit. And he finally turned to me and he said, Ken, this is a show about whether or not I'm going to become an asshole. That was, that was the, that was his answer. And I wasn't sure 
Was he talking about himself, Gary Shandling, or was he talking about Larry Sanders? And he qualified it. He goes, he goes, I'm not one, but I have the potential to become one. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, okay, well that, I guess he's, is he talking about himself or the character? I wasn't sure, but that, that actually was, that was my, that let me know everything I needed to know about what that show was about. That was a show about neither Gary nor Larry. It was about this kind of gray area in between the two and, and, mm-hmm. and quite a remarkable show it was. I'm happy to say, again, I'm not patting myself on the back at all, but I really feel that that show in retrospect was a harbinger of like a lot of the more tonally ambitious, you know, half hour, half hour shows that are on television now. I mean, I think you can trace a line from a show like Fleabag or Catastrophe mm-hmm. back to something like Larry Sanders in terms of just broadening our idea about what a half hour can, be- how a half hour story can behave. Mm-hmm. Well, you've worked on several shows like that. Larry Sanders, Bernie, the Bernie Mac show broke the, the norm. The Office, certainly, and you set the template for that by directing the pilot. But I was wondering, how do you navigate your own directorial voice, but to the distinctive vision of the person who created the show so that both are served, if that made sense? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think about this a lot. I mean, I feel like I like to think that my, one of my strengths is that I have a kind of flexibility as a director. I mean, there are some directors who are quite amazing at doing one particular thing and they do it repeatedly and it's wonderful. But I like the idea of sort of uh, being a little less easy to pigeonhole. And, and to that end, I feel like I've, I love the idea of trying to work with a creative person like, for instance, Gary Shandling, or Greg Daniels, who you know created the American version of The Office. Linwood Boomer, who created uh, Malcolm in the Middle. I didn't launch that show. I didn't direct the pilot, but I worked on it quite a bit. Larry Wilmore, who did the Bernie Mac show. And trying to find where my personality, where my personal instincts overlap, like with, with the Venn diagram of me and you know, Greg Daniels. Where, what's the overlap? And I like I love the idea of. Uh, it's not simply serving someone else's vision. It's, it's sort of like trying to puzzle out who they are. And, 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 and that allows me to bring new ideas to the table. But you'll appreciate this because, I, I mean, I think about it also in, in light of great, I mean, there are film directors that I love who simply w- never stayed in one genre. I mean, someone like Leo McCary is someone I love. So Leo McCary directed the Marx Brothers in Duck Soup, but then not too long after that, he directed this wonderful drama, Make Way for Tomorrow. One director, two wildly different films. I mean, more recently, a director I really love, and I really love, is Stephen Frears. I mean, Stephen Frears, who would do, I mean, just all over the place, from the Grifters to Florence Foster Jenkins to High Fidelity, like, who is he? Well, the truth is, he just brings his humanity to any number of genres or subjects and that to me that to me is the high road i love that i love to be on that road well i was going to ask this later but uh since you brought it up because your feature films are diverse you have Mm -hmm. family films you have the coming of age films with you know uh, sisterhood of the traveling pants romantic comedy uh just not that into you so what do you look for in a project well the main thing and this is re- regardless of whether it's a television script or a feature script, I look for some, hu- I try to make some human connection to the story. And, um, you know, I've used, I've, I mentioned this in the book, but the film, He's Just Not That Into You, uh, a romantic themed film, I don't think of it even as a comedy, had, had his nine characters. And so for me, when I read the script, what I was delighted to discover was that each of the nine characters, you know, whether it was Jennifer Connelly's character or Justin Long's character, I, I felt like I had behaved like those characters myself at different points in my life. So I feel like I could trace a line between, say, Justin Long's storyline and some stupid thing I've done in the past or something like that. So I felt very comfortable that I could put something on the screen that people would in turn find relatable, sometimes painfully relatable to their own lives. 
Uh, and I can tell, I, uh, again, I mentioned this in the book, but the real turning point came working on Follow That Bird. Because I, um, you know, Follow That Bird has, you know, the, the main character is an eight foot bird. <laughs> and at the beginning of working on that picture, I, I was just preoccupied with how to photograph an eight foot bird. <laughs> and the big bird was nothing more at the beginning than like a, an exotic, beautiful, odd object that I had to figure out how to how to block scenes with an eight foot bird. Mm -hmm. What happened over the course of shooting the film is I started to make an emotional connection to Big Bird's story. And it sounds, you know, maybe it sounds kind of funny, but in fact, Big Bird's emotional journey in that story is very profound. Mm -hmm. And what happened is as I uh, became more invested in the, the human, I'll call it the human quality of the story, uh, bird became a subject not an object and i feel like you know th that was a turning point for me that that um you know i i as i put in the book i said that it, you know it took an eight foot bird to teach me that part of my job as a director is to become a, a student of human nature mm -hmm. um, so that's the so to go back to your question mm -hmm. can i make a human connection to it that's mm -hmm. the key so how did you become involved with the office and did you have any trepidations about taking this show that is held in such high esteem and not remaking it, but adapting it, you know, an American oh, yeah. version? Oh, yeah. I would say that I had, I had some anxieties about it. I think everyone had certain anxieties about it. I had acquaintances who said, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> I mean, people were very, people were not shy about saying, you know, the critics are going to kill you, et cetera. Even Greg Daniels, you know, has shared with me that he had certain anxieties about, uh, you know, doing an adaptation of such a beloved and, and, and brilliant show. And he told me, he actually said this on a podcast that when, when prepping the show, he actually had these anxiety dreams in which he was on trial in front of all his comedy peers who were saying, why are you doing this? So, but I think that, you know, pretty quickly um, into the shooting of the pilot, we, I mean, we had no clue whether A, NBC would want to continue and pick up and order a series that, you know, it was just a pilot, or B, whether anyone would watch it. But we did feel, I think, collectively that there was something interesting going on. There was something unique that didn't, the show wasn't behaving like a normal broadcast television half hour show. And at the same time, it was very, it felt very, uh, kind of, well, I mean, it felt very funny, but it also just felt uh, very accessible. All the characters really pop. So, I, so again, all we were just sort of hoping against hope that NBC would give us a shot, and that audiences would give us a shot too. And you you mentioned Casino Night earlier, and it's such a special episode in the mythology of the series. Mm -hmm. When you're making it, do you, you obviously know it's an important episode because it was the season two cliffhanger. But is there any sense on, you know, while you're making it, we're doing something really special here, or is it just yeah. another day at the office? <laughs> well, that one was that one was tricky because if I'm not mistaken, unlike every episode up until that one, this one was like so-called supersized. It was like longer. It was like it was basically, I don't know how long it is actually, but it was longer than a normal broadcast network half hour show. We you know that was so it was it was special on that level. It was special because clearly this major turning point in the Pam Jim relationship where, you know, he's he's leaving. He's leaving to go to another branch and then right before leaving, he kisses her. Mm -hmm. And and but on top of that, I felt like it was I like the fact that, and again, all credit to Steve Carell who wrote this episode, that it, I, I felt like there were so many romantic relationships that were being uh, served in the story whether it was Phyllis and her you know, soon to be fiance, Bob Vance, or whether it was Dwight and Angela, or whether it was Jim and Pam, or whether it was Michael and you know, the two women that he's sort of torn between. It felt like, it felt as, a, as an episode, as a story, it just felt like a wonderful sort of romantic, let me see if I'm gonna use this word right, rondelay. It was kind of like all these different romantic plots sort of intertwined and, and you know, a little night music. It had that kind of nice kind of quality of uh, smiles of a summer night. Um, I don't know if anyone thought that except me, but I felt, I felt, 
Um, it's a testament to you. It's a testament to the writing and to the cast that the show seems, you know, each episode seems entirely improvised. How much improvisation is there? Almost none. Now I can only speak about the direct, uh, excuse me, the episodes I directed. I directed some, I think around 15, 13, 15. So I'm not, I'm not being coy. I think somewhere 13 to 15. And to, uh, mostly the scripts were, I mean, it's a very tightly scripted show, it's, but it's well written to sound improvised. And there were certainly improvised moments. And, you know, among other things, you know, you've got someone at the helm, Steve Carell, at the helm of that ensemble, who's like a remarkably gifted improv improviser. But no, it was a very tightly scripted show. The only thing I will say is that early on, when I did the scenes in which each of the characters have their little, you know, talking head interviews, mm -hmm. I definitely, um, because sometimes those little interview pieces were like one line long. So they were very much like sound bites. So in order to get the actors kind of up, you know, kind of warmed up to the scripted line, I would actually ask them a lot of questions in character as if I was the documentarian that they would answer, you know, they would improvise answers. These were not part of the finished product per se, but occasionally Greg Daniels may have pulled a line or two out of those imp improvised sections and put it in the show, or the writers in general might've seen those improvised sections and used them to help develop those characters a little more. Yeah. Unless I'm mistaken, The Office is the only series you directed where you directed the pilot and then you came back and did the finale. And, and I, yeah, and it must have been very emotional. It was very thing. emotional. I also came back and did the 100th episode, mm -hmm. which, what's it called? Company Picnic, which is also, I guess I, I was, I was the, you know, I feel like I was the designated Jim and Pam person in a way, because I came back to uh, do the episode in which we've discovered that Pam is pregnant. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say the, the one of the more emotional things about the series finale was that I was, I was like the prodigal son. I'd been away for a while uh, and I was just so uh, relieved and heartened by the, by the fact that everyone, you know, was happy to have me back. And on some level, my being there, I hadn't worked on the show for uh, several seasons, but my being there, I think for some of the actors and some of the crew kind of brought everybody full circle back to our very original instincts for the show. So I think it was kind of fun for everyone to kind of just my, not even anything. I it's not even so much something I said or directed in a way, but just my being there sort of brought everyone back to the, to the starting point. You also directed the episode, which is my personal favorite Jim and Pam moment, The Job, where the job you is back for yes. her, <laughs> and, you know, what was the question? You know, that. That was, um, what was, I would say that is, that final talking head of Jenna Fisher's is, is in my top 10 favorite scenes of anything I've directed. I think she would, she might agree as well. She, she, she's also loves that scene. Mm. Um, so moving on to directing, again, one of the great things about the book is that it's a lot of practical uh, advice based on your experiences on set and, mm -hmm. and, and your career. And um, so there was, Frank Capra wrote his autobiography and he talked about working with Edward G. Robinson and Frank Sinatra and how different working methods they had and Edward G. Robinson liked to rehearse and Frank Sinatra was one take and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you work in that situation with, uh, you know, actors who have different philosophies? Right. I think it's, I mean, it, it the tricky, I mean, that's actually a, a, a fairly typical challenge is to have a pair of actors, each of whom gets up to speed at different times. So, I mean, I've definitely worked with, done scenes where actor A is prepared for starters, prepared and takes <laughs> one and two or like really, they, you know, they really nail it. And their scene partner, and again, nothing against either actor, the scene partner is not awake yet, let alone hitting their stride. So around take seven, mm -hmm. their partner is suddenly like doing this amazing stuff. But by then the first actor is kind of like getting a little tired. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So I, I think part of what you need to do is, I mean, obviously you don't know that on day one, but pretty quickly you need to kind of suss out where people hit their stride, what people's strengths are. And you try to kind of work, you try to kind of, again, it's a time management challenge too, like try to kind of organize your day so that you're using their energy, their best energy at the right time in every scene. Mm -hmm. And there's also different, I'll, I, this is something I definitely talk about in the book, in the film, He's Just Not Dead Into You. Again, of those nine characters, there, there are two who are sort of first among equals. And those are the two characters played by Jennifer Goodwin and Justin Long. And they have a, they share, a, they have a lot of scenes together. And my, you know, being that that's, it's a, not only a, you know, it's a relationship film, it's a romantic theme film for my goal is to kind of keep these two characters in the frame together as much as possible, instead of like bopping back and forth between their close-ups. So with that particular duo, Justin Long is like a, is a great, great improviser. In fact, he much, I think he's at least at the time happier to like not look at the script and just kind of come up with things off the cup. Jenny Goodwin, on the other hand, is literally like, you know, went to the you know, some dramatic royal, you know, Shakespeare, you know, school in, in London. And, and it couldn't be more classically trained. So trying to get their two very different styles to mesh was a trick. I mean, and, and uh, again, I won't go into great detail, except that it took a while. And at, at the beginning, their scenes were like, <laughs> this is they, this whole picture depends on these two people clicking and their styles really don't mesh at all. So happily, we figured it out. So, <laughs> And, you know, all artists are works in progress. And you've worked with you know, great actors, you know, we've mentioned a few of them, but also some of, you know, Jeff Goldblum, very uh, idiosyncratic, and Peter Falk, and Jason Alexander, and I was wondering if working with them has made you a better director of actors. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, again, them. all of them, I, I, I feel like one of the great things about working with people, like, I'll say Jason Alexander for a second, I worked with Jason sort of at the height of his you know, tenure on the Seinfeld show when he played the, you know, the hotel manager in, in Dunstan Checks In. And for me, what was fun is getting to, to work with a, first of all, super gifted actor doing not the character that he's most known for, but actually getting to flex, getting to kind of exercise some different creative muscles. That was really, that was really exciting to me. Um, and I would say with someone like I mean, with someone like Peter Falk, who's, you know, kind of this kind of, he's a, he's a legend for many reasons, but in, for me, because of his association with John Cassavetes, I, for me, not only did I enjoy working with him, but I actually used him as a resource. I like grilled him about the process of acting. Uh, so the answer to your question is in some cases, I like used certain actors like a textbook. I said, what would you do in this? Or what, how did Cassavetes give you a note? What, what I wanted, I, I didn't, I don't come from acting. So I needed, I, I, I was blessed to have these kind of living resources. I could literally, uh, if they were in the right mood, <laughs> get them to share about, you know, aspects of their process. So, so you mentioned Dunstan checks in. So now we can get to oh. my favorite. I think it's my favorite story in the book. And you write about how the movie, you were afraid that the studio was going to dump it. There was a 10 o'clock in the morning screening of it, of a family film instead of in the afternoon. But after the screening, you met someone could, who was there. Can you talk, tell that story? Please? I will. Yeah, no, it was, again, I was, I don't want to say I was demoralized, but I was just concerned. I was concerned that they weren't, that 20th Century Fox didn't give it a, you know, a fancy premiere on an evening and say we had a 10 a.m. screening on a Sunday morning. So after the screening, and it, the screening went really well, one of the cast members, wonderful actor named Glenn Shaddix, uh, came up to me to congratulate me. And, he, and next to him on his arm was an older woman, probably, eh, she probably in her late 70s. And Glenn said, uh, uh, Ken, I want you to, I want to introduce you to my date for the premiere. This is Eleanor Keaton. And I was like, Eleanor Keaton. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Eleanor Keaton 
was the widow of Buster Keaton. And, and Buster Keaton certainly is whew, not only a hero of mine, but Buster Keaton was a huge influence on the making of Dunstan Checks In. I mean, I, I actually came to think of my orangutan star with his beautiful deadpan face as a kind of Keaton stand in. <laughs> so, and so um, Eleanor said, Buster would have loved this film. And, and, and literally I thought, okay, I can leave now. <laughs> I'm done. I can retire. I, I don't need to do any more work in this business. That's the best compliment I'll ever get. <laughs> so. That's such a great story. I'm embarrassed to say that it's only recently I saw Steamboat Bill Jr. for the first time. And Amazing. your book helped me uh, realize the connection between the scene with Buster trying on the hats and oh. uh, Dunstan... Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it real quickly because what happened is Eleanor Keaton continued after telling me that Buster would have loved this film. She said Buster would have particularly loved uh, the film's homage to uh, uh, Steamboat Bill Jr. And what she was referring to is a scene in this beautiful, I mean, please see this film, Steamboat Bill Jr. Yeah. Buster Keaton plays uh, a college graduate who is very artsy, you know, he's a very artsy guy. He comes home uh, wearing a beret and his very manly father insists that they go to the local store to buy a manly hat. So there's this scene in which uh, Buster and the fellow playing his father go to this you know, big table full of hats and Buster tries on like about 20 different hats. It's so beautiful. It's such a, I mean, what Buster can do with like just a table full of props and make it funny and brilliant is amazing but in Dunstan the title character the orangutan is a jewel thief and breaks into hotel rooms and steals people's jewelry well he breaks into one woman's room and is about to leave with her jewelry when he notices on the vanity uh, table a bunch of her hats so he pauses and kind of parks himself in front of the vanity mirror and tries on all of her hats and that was very much um, well, my tribute to a scene from a Buster Keaton film, and then the man's widow s yeah. comes to see the film and, and recognizes it. So, I, I, I again, I could uh, I could have retired right then and there. <laughs> it's a great story, and there are many more stories like that in the book. I don't want anyone to think that I've spoiled the book for them. Um, so you've heard that that expression that's attributed to the British actor uh, Edmund Keane. Mm -hmm. On his deathbed, he said, uh, dying is easy, but comedy is hard. Uh, you make it look easy, though. And uh, what is your approach to directing comedy versus drama? Do you have a preference? No, I don't, and I and I, I I know that quote very well. And I think maybe what I, if I have a, an M.O. in this regard, it's that I don't think of myself as a comedy director. Mm -hmm. And what I try and do when I have a comedy scene, let's say it's a scene from The Office or a scene from Dunstan, is to make sure that there's something, uh, make sure I can ground the scene, ground it in some emotional reality. I mean, there's a lot of great comedies well, I'll just say there's a lot of comedic material where I feel like there's a lot of very smart writing, a lot of witty things are being said, but there's nothing that's really grabbing you. There's nothing really. So when I look at a comedy scene, I try and say, what, what's the, how can I ground this in reality? And then the flip side of it is, if I'm directing a scene that's a straight dramatic scene, what I try and do is leaven the scene with humor. And, and what that means is sort of hunting through the, hunting through the drama to look for the humor that's hiding there. So I feel like I, I that's how I sort of approach both drama and comedy. And, and if, ultimately though, I just sort of see them all as one thing. That's maybe, and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm hardly alone in that way, but, but I, I, I mean, there are always, com I'll call them comedy management issues when you're doing a comedic scene, you know, you want to, you, you feel like, okay, if somebody made that entrance a couple beats later, it might help this, but it's not as important as making sure that the scene has some hum humanity in it. Yeah. Before we turn this over to uh, audience questions, one thing I really like about the book 
uh, is your references to the masters. You mentioned Ernst Lubitsch. Uh, you mentioned, you've mentioned tonight, the Marx Brothers and Leo McCary. And you're, you offer an analysis of several iconic classic screen moments and images and their impact on you. And we live in a time, I mean, when I was in high school, I would have killed to be able to call up a Marx Brothers movie with the, you know, on my computer instantly. But we live in a time where film literacy seems to be at an all time low, which I can't understand. And there was a survey a few years ago and it said that a quarter of millennials have never watched a film from the 1940s or 50s all the way through. Wow. And how important is it wow. to not only filmmakers, but to, to film goers and film lovers? How important is it to be aware of the people who wow. came before? Well, first of all, I'm just sort of reacting to that upsetting statistic. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Not my well, stuff, of course, no, but, but yeah. No, but here's the key. This is the key thing. And this is one of the things that's in the book is I, I really encourage all filmmakers, but, you know, regardless of what the material is you're doing, but, you know, try and tell your story with pictures. That's the thing, pictures. And to that end, I'm constantly trying to reacquaint myself or acquaint myself with, for instance, the great achievements of the silent era and the great achievements of the directors that began in the silent era, but the, but brought those skills, those picture telling, picture storytelling skills into the sound era. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, it's, it's like, how could you, it's like, it's like learning a language without learning the verbs. Mm -hmm. So you have to know this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that for me, it, it's, uh, and also it's a pleasure. I, 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 but I also, this is the other thing I wanted to mention when you talked about I feel like there is something lost right now and it has nothing to do with uh, technology. It has to do with the pandemic. And that is the, the, the ability to enjoy things in a, in a group setting. I, I'm sure I can speak for both of us that you know some of the greatest moments in my film going ever were seeing a film like a Marx Brothers film in a packed house where you couldn't hear the screen and it, you, you, had to go, you had to go back to see the film a second time because you couldn't hear it. There was so much laughter. Wow, I miss that. Yeah, I really miss that. So. Uh, I don't know if Grace is there um, for uh, audience questions, but I have one here um, from Mike uh, Magli Mag uh, Magliani. And if I got that wrong, I'm so sorry. But he asks Harrison Ford revealed in a tribute to Steven Spielberg that during Raiders of the Lost Ark, he had an unusual situation and suggested a change that became one of the most memorable scenes in the movie. And as a director, have you ever encountered an ad lib situation or a suggestion presented by an actor that you were able to, to use as part of your film? Oh, I, I would say that. I mean, and I think that what uh, Mike is referring to is the famous using a gun instead of a sword moment. Right. And, and I think that the, that, is, that is the perfect example of what we would we call a happy accident where I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but you know, maybe Harrison Ford wasn't feeling up to, maybe he wasn't feeling well and he didn't want to do a big sword fight. So they came up with the gun idea instead and it turned into a great comic moment. There are many, many great examples of basically people having to kind of think on their feet and come up with, by the way, Spielberg, I mean, the biggest one of all is the fact that you know he makes this film called Jaws and they build this mechanical shark that promptly breaks. <laughs> They've invested all this time and money into a shark that won't work. So what Spielberg does to solve the problem makes for a much better film. He he makes the, the he creates all these images that suggest the shark as opposed to showing it. It's it's great cinema thinking. So I mean, the, to answer the question, I I don't have any specifics on hand, but I can tell you there have been many times where I come in with a really carefully planned out idea and an actor, so, or, or I just observe something and it's like, again, flexibility, throw the plan out, go with what's, you know, go, go with what's staring you in the face, that's much better, so. Uh, uh, someone named uh, PB has a great one that's especially pertinent to you who directed episodes of The Office and The Larry Sanders Show. Well, when you were directing, was there ever a moment that 
you cracked up to the point where you had to kind of walk away or that you ruined a take or had to stop action? Well, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I on both shows, I got used to sort of like watching the scenes standing by the camera while biting a lip because I didn't want to start laughing. But by the way, if you talk to the cast members of The Office, they all they all struggled to keep from breaking up while, when Steve was doing something. Steve, <laughs> I mean, and, and in fact, the cast members actually, like it's almost like a poker game. They all, they all felt like each cast member had a tell <laughs> that you could you could tell that they were about to break <laughs> so i think that that, that is a uh, that is a, a a that's a good hazard to have that's a good problem to have in a comedy um okay uh there was a half a question posted and the other half just came in from wyatt okay. Parish and I'm. Uh, this relates to Butch Cassidy. Oh, great. And he says, "Do you think that that bicycle scene, which uh, in Butch Cassidy, which was unlike anything that had ever been seen in a western before, do you think that that was an improvisation or where there were a lot of takes?" Um, I'm, I assume, and I haven't seen it for a while. That's just um, Catherine Ross and Paul Newman on the bike together. Is that the scene? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, that's the scene. If I'm not mistaken, that's the scene where we hear the song "Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head." Uh -huh. uh, I I don't. Ha that's a good question. I can tell you only one thing about that scene, and that is that Robert Redford told me that he, at least at the beginning, he hated that song and and, and was appalled that they were going to include that song in this film. <laughs> so, but I, yeah. I'm glad they did. Just. Parenthetically, I actually talked to B.J. Thomas about uh, on the 40th anniversary, and he actually had laryngitis when they recorded that. And that's wow. why his voice sounds a little bit scratchy. They had offered it to Ray Stevens. I don't know if you know that. He was the first choice. Wow. And Ray Stevens turned it down because he was working on a different song. And, I will. Can, can I mention one other uh, Butch and Sundance factoid, which may be... Sure. Uh, is it Parrish? Parrish may know or others listening may know, but originally uh, the roles were reversed. Newman was the Sundance kid and Redford was going to be uh, Butch Cassidy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, they, they had cast it that way. And I think George Roy Hill finally figured out that um, in fact, that they were completely <laughs> wrong for those roles and perfect for the, the other ones. So they switched uh -huh. So. Um, Marty has a, a great question, mm -hmm. and basically the answer, Marty, is to to buy this book. But um, <laughs> uh, Marty would like to know your advice for young directors in developing their skills. Well, uh, there's there that's another hour's worth of conversation that I would <laughs> be happy to have at another time. But I would say the main thing is two two things. I'll just boil it down to two things. One. If you are passionate to do this, passion will win the day every time. If you have to sit in a room with, whether it's Captain Kangaroo or who knows who you're interviewing with, if you're passionate about this, your, your listener, your uh, interviewer will sit up and take notice. And the second thing is, I've kind of alluded to this already, if you're trying to direct and you get a chance to meet on a project, or if you're trying to sell an idea of your own, make sure you personalize it in the room. You know, don't say this is a story about five friends who know you have to. I mean, I hopefully that you have a personal connection. So you say this happened to me. This happened to me. I need to tell this story. I'd love for you to be my colleague and help me get it made. If you don't want to, that's fine, because I'm going to figure out a way to get it made. But if you can personalize it, if you can lead with the fact that you have a personal need to tell this story as opposed to, oh, I think I can do a good job doing this, you're going to, again, you will get people to sit up and take notice. Great. One more, and then I'll throw it back to Grace. Mm -hmm. um, you talk in the book about taking meetings and you talk about studio notes. So I have to ask, what was like, the most inappropriate, worst studio note that you were ever saddled with. Wow. <laughs> I, that, I, I'm going to be a little evasive and say <laughs> there are a lot of them to choose from. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that I have a, a really bad one right uh -huh. off the top of my head. I'm gonna, I, <laughs> I, I, 
I'm going to email you the answer. <laughs> I don't okay. have the answer. So. Well, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, I also want to thank Jeff and Ellen. Uh, and Grace, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, uh, I recommend everyone uh, read Mr. Koffes' book. Um, I, I read most of it last night and found it very readable, uh, very interesting, and very endearing as well. Um, so uh, be good to yourself and, and uh, take a look. So that's a wrap for tonight then. And um, I just want everyone to know that when the webinar ends, you should see a brief survey on your screen. So if you care to fill that out, that would be appreciated. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Mr. Kofis. Um, and good night. Good night. Thanks again for having me. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs> Thank you.